Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number seven of the interviews playlist. Our special guest for today is Austin. Austin, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Austin Solak, and I'm a first year medical student at the Schulich School of Medicine at Weston. Awesome. So let's start from the very beginning. What high school did you go to and what undergraduate program did you say? Yeah, of course. So I was born and raised in Ontario and I went to high school in Brantford, a high school called North Park Collegiate. So it was a relatively uh, smaller high school, I believe around 800 students. And then after high school, I went on to do my undergrad at McMaster in Life Sciences. And following that, I did a master's at the University of Toronto. Oh, awesome. So what uh, influenced you to study life sciences at McMaster? So I would say my interest in uh, medicine, uh, biotech, um, and everything really related to science and technology, it really started to kind of bloom in my uh, grade 11 and grade 12 year. And kind of during that, during those two years, when I kind of fell in love to sciences, I had a lot of great great teachers, great mentors. And I started kind of investigating, looking into the different programs all around Canada and Ontario. And I think what drew me into McMaster and particularly the campus was uh, one of the main factors. I think McMaster, uh, even from the different universities that I've attended thus far, has one of the most beautiful campuses. I, I just, I love it a lot. Uh, the school itself has a great community feel. Um, it's very welcoming and very supporting. And I think uh, the strength of the life science program in particular, you can really take it where you want it to go. Um, if that's a biology, chemistry, uh, do something with a co-op or um, really uh, take it where you want. So I think there's a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. And also McMaster is a very highly, I think, um, renowned school, which also I was very drawn to. Awesome. So what you, like, what do you believe um, are some like volunteers and extracurricular experiences you had in your high school before you went to undergrad, which helped drive those interests? Yeah, for sure. So in high school, I, I started to get involved in a lot of like uh, clinical and hospital um, volunteer work around grade 11. So I, I remember in grade 11, I started the specialist high skills major, the, the schism for short, and I did the health and wellness one. And kind of through that, I was able to do volunteer work in the fracture clinic at the local hospital in my hometown, uh, in the day surgery, uh, in day surgery, and then also in a general nursing ward. So I was really able to get right from grade 11 and grade 12, I was able to get a lot of different clinical experience, work alongside a lot of nurses, a lot of different support staff, speak to a few different physicians. And I even had the opportunity to observe a few different surgeries as well. So I think um, that really actually was one of the first uh, major experiences, I would say, in my life that drew me into my interest in, in the medical field. Fantastic. Yeah, that's very useful to have those exposures early on in life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, let's talk about your first year, your first year in undergrad. How was it? How was the transition from high school to first year in terms of classes, the workload, uh, dealing with professors, dealing with classmates, um, gaining new connections? Yeah, totally. No, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I remember coming into university, I was, I was, uh, feeling quite prepared, very, very excited. Um, but I do remember my my very first midterm was probably one of the lowest grades that I ever experienced in university. And I think that was a really uh, a wake up call for me. And what I learned from that very first kind of um, disheartening experience was that university is completely different than high school. It requires a much deeper level understanding of the content and being able to apply different concepts in very unique and novel ways. And I think everybody, it takes everybody a different amount of time to kind of get comfortable into the much busier workloads and the more complex type of topics. But I think what I found to be um, very helpful for me is I'm like, a, I'm a person who likes to be very organized. So I structure out all my days, the times that I want to get things accomplished and try to break those down 
um, a little bit more granularly. And I kind of was able to develop some of that time management skill sets, I would say early on, which helped me. And in addition to that, I would say universities, it's very, it's very, very supportive, especially I found at McMaster was the, the, the students, my peers were very supportive. We would work together on different assignments. Um, I even remember studying for one of the uh, final midterms in my first year, me and my one friend, who he's also now in medical school, but we studied um, in the basement of our res building and we would just kind of go back and forth. And I think there was just a lot of good collaboration between all the students. The professors are also very professional, very welcoming. They treat you as a peer, which I thought, I remember in my, uh, some of my first classes, the professors introducing themselves of doctor as doctor so-and-so, but you can also call me by my first name. And I think that was something uh, very different than what I experienced in high school. So because you are now a university student, you are a much more mature individual. It's, um, you have the ability to form close relationships with your professors and with the academic community, which, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, for sure. Those are very good points. Um, how did you enrich your first year academic experience like outside the classroom in terms of volunteers, extracurriculars, even how did you support yourself financially? Yeah, of course. So in terms of extracurriculars, I think I, from kind of the get go, I was trying to keep my, my eyes and ears open of the different opportunities that are available. And more or less try to focus on those that are of interest to me. And I, I talked to a lot of the upper year students, kind of what different activities that, that they're involved in and more or less try to gauge um, some of my different paths from the different experiences that I, that I heard from my peers and my, my mentors as well. Uh, however, I think the one of the standout experiences in my first year was it's something called the impact project with Dr. Kajura at McMaster. So essentially what this project is, we work uh, myself as a science student, we work alongside engineering students, uh, physical therapy students, occupational therapy students, and uh, medical students. And essentially we build devices for people in the community living with different disabilities. And I joined that uh, probably in the first or second month as part of my undergrad. And that was very heavily promoted by Dr. Kajura, who was one of my undergraduate professors and one of my, still my, one of my lifelong mentors. So I think the advice that I would give to first years is um, keep, keep an open mind at different opportunities. Just keep your ears and your eyes open because there's, there's a lot of great experiences out there. And I think ultimately you want to spend your time doing something that is meaningful to yourself that you enjoy and that you can create an, you can uh, generally make an impact on society. Yeah. That's a very valuable advice. Um, so like moving on from second year up until you graduated, what do you believe are some major points that happened in the, like over those years, which helped you become um, a well-rounded candidate for your master program and even for med school? Yeah, of course. So after my second year is when I actually wrote the first the, the MCAT for the very first time. And I, I took the summer off. I wrote the MCAT. I didn't do as well as, as I would have liked, um, actually very, very quite poorly. And it was around that time when I started to kind of reevaluate my career path and what the next steps kind of bring for me. And so it was after my second year, moving into my third year, when I started to kind of explore different career options, different masters, really make sure that I do have a plan A, B, C. And I learned about the field of digital health, health informatics, which ultimately is what I did my master's in. And through my third year and my fourth year, I think there was probably two standout moments that I can talk about. So one was my, my thesis research project slash a project that I started prior to my thesis. And this was involved, this was a clinical epidemiological project. So essentially this, this was working with uh, one of the faculty at McMaster and we were looking to investigate the impact of type two diabetes, fasting plasma glucose, and uh, a few other um, 
diabetes predispose, predisposing genes to different maternal and fetal outcomes. So I, I gained a lot of great research experience in that regard throughout the two years of my final two years of my undergrad. And then in the third, in between third year and fourth year, I also worked at an optometry clinic for full time. And there I was able to get a lot, 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 lot great of patient, patient experience um, working with probably seeing 130 patients per day, working alongside the physicians. And I would say actually it was around this time when my interest in health informatics really started to kind of stand out because what I didn't realize is that we are still faxing a lot of our health records. And I remember there was one evening in particular where we had a quite an emergent case where we needed to send a referral to an ophthalmologist from the optometry clinic. And we just kept trying to refer, send the fax, phone, make a phone call, and we were just not getting through to the on-call specialist. And it was, we eventually did, thankfully, but it was kind of in that moment where I was like, it's 2017 or 2018 at the time. And I, I really think that there is um, more that we can do. And that kind of spurred me into looking more into the digital health and health informatics uh, kind of kind of space. Oh, awesome. So speaking about research, what are some tips and advices you would give to undergraduate students who want to get their foot, their foot into research, but don't know how? And like, how would, um, like what your, I would say, how would you differentiate wet labs to dry labs? And what are your advices to like undergraduate students interested in each uh, type of uh, research? Yeah, of course. So the way the way that I that I approached approached it personally is I looked uh, a lot of the university, all, all the different universities. They have a lot of different faculty and a lot of different research environments, um, be it that wet lab or dry lab, which I which I can definitely speak a little bit more to. But I sent out a few different emails to a few diff different faculty, uh, essentially speaking to some of how their research interests align to mine and that I would potentially be interested in working on a few of their, of their projects. Um, I also spoke to my uh, career goals and career aspirations, but I think ultimately it's really important of showing that you're interested in these, um, these individuals and in their work and that you are, are really eager truly to make a difference in, in your work and their work and be a successful member of their team. So essentially what I did, I, I, as I mentioned, I sent out a few different emails. I set up a few or that led to a few different interviews. And then ultimately I would say me and another uh, faculty member, we connected quite well and that led to me working on my, my research project. Oh, awesome. And how do you believe your undergraduate research uh, experience helped you in your master's? And how would you, like, I, I would say, imagine yourself if you haven't done any, under, any research in your undergrad, how would it have been different? Yeah, for sure. I think, so my, my research was very focused in clinical uh, clinical epidemiology. So I would say... One thing that it helped me to gain an understanding of is the different ways that you can use data to really drive different clinical decisions, both from a research perspective, as well as a clinical perspective. Because essentially, we, we looked at a database of different genotypes, different phenotypes, and then we were able to find correlations between those. And ultimately, this may or may not lead to different clinical decision making. And in my master's, it was very focused, as I mentioned, on digital health and healthcare technology. And a lot of the work that's being done is regarding uh, clinical data and how we can use data to drive different healthcare decision making. Uh, my, re my master's wasn't a research-based master's, it was course-based, but I think a lot of the overarching concepts and overarching themes that I was able to learn and then apply from my research definitely it definitely helped me throughout my throughout my master's and it also assisted me uh, during my application and during my interview process and I was able to speak to um, a few of those kind of highlights 
Awesome. How would you differentiate the benefits of a course-based research master's to, uh, sorry, a course-based master's to research-based master's? And um, what do you think are some primary key points that led you to choose course-based master's over research-based? Of course. So for me, I was interested in really moving into like industry um, after my master's. So I wanted to work uh, initially for the private sector. And that was kind of one of the reasons that I wanted to do a course-based master's was because I, while I enjoyed research, I didn't want that to be necessarily my only career, I would say for like the next foreseeable future. So I was quite keen on doing a course-based master's that offered a co-op or a practicum where I could get that real experience in industry, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the clinical setting kind of thing. So um, I would say if you go into a course-based master's, ideally one with a co-op or with a practicum, I think is very strong because I would say that it was during that time that I was really able to, to build a good uh, network of in individuals and really gain a, a quite a, quite a good skill set. However, I guess on the other side, the research-based masters, different sorry different yeah different research masters also have their their pros as well, and I think even looking at a few of my my current classmates in medical school, a lot of the ones that did research-based masters were able to work on some very interesting projects, and um, I would say contribute really really well to different scientific uh, findings in scientific li literature and probably gain, they gained a different skill set than my own. So I, I would say it really depends on what you're trying to get out of it, what your career, what you want to do for your career path, be that more in the acad academia side, industry, private sector, public sector. But I think every program has a unique offering and you really just want to be able to align what you want to do with what the program offers. Awesome. So having, um, I would say, having spoken so much about academia, let's move into your side hustle experiences. Of course, let's, of course. Uh, yeah, let's start with your YouTube channel, your, uh, your business, and um, your passion for learning languages as well. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. So yeah, we can start off with my YouTube channel. So this was something that I started probably originally when I was 13, 13 years old. And I was only kind of working on it here and here and there. But I would say since I since I got into medical school, I thought this would be a really good opportunity to be able to share my experiences in medical school. And I want to be able to, to help out and guide a lot of students, high school, university students who are interested in, a, in pursuing a career in medicine, or they want to learn more about what the day to day is like, or even from the perspective of, of a medical student. So um, a few weeks ago, I released a, a desk setup video, and this was something I was quite passionate about. I worked a lot, um, quite a few hours on like perfecting almost my desk setup. And I was really, really happy when I was able to put the time in and create a YouTube video. And I was really happy of how it turned out. And I have a few other video uh, videos in the works. So stay tuned. Uh, feel free to check out my channel. It's just my name, Austin Solak. And yeah, I'm really excited for just to uh, create create new content, and I would say just share my my different interests with uh, with the YouTube community. And then next, shifting to my company, yeah. So in April of this year, I co-founded a company called Somi with one of my friends. So we we founded a company that we we sell cup carriers for bubble tea and for coffee and for other drinks. So this was, um, the, the idea, I suppose, was initially inspired by one of my very close Taiwanese friends. They, they gifted me a similar type of um, cup carrier that they had received from Taiwan. And from that, I thought this, this is a really, really unique idea. I was walking in the Eaton Center in Toronto, and I received probably about 10 different compliments. And I remember thinking like, this is such a cool idea. I really love it for myself. And I think a lot of other people will like it as well. And we took it from an idea of how do we want to kind of approach this? And probably four months later, after a lot of work, we were able to launch the company. 
And we're still, I would say, learning a lot, but we do have a few bubble tea partners in the B2B space. Uh, we also have a B2C uh, Shopify e-commerce platform. And I would say every day, each and every day, we try to just make our business a little bit better. And it's it's a really fun, uh, fun side project. And I hope to just continue to grow this each and every day, each and every month, each and every year. So I never thought I would be an entrepreneur per se, but I've, I've really enjoyed this, this opportunity. And my, my co-partner Min Chan is, is absolutely wonderful, works so, so hard and brings a lot of great creative ideas. So I'm very, I'm very lucky. Um, I would say, cause we, we are able to complement each other very, very well, which is, which is nice. Um, and then I'll, I'll shift, uh, to the language learning portion as well. So I would say learning about new cultures and new languages has always kind of been something that I've been interested in, but what really sparked my interest was in 2019, actually before COVID, I did my, one of my very first largest kind of, uh, backpacking trips. So I went into seven different countries in 2019, uh, in Europe. And it was through there where I really was able to gain a very vast uh, understanding and experience of different cultures. And one of my favorite countries when I was traveling during that time was Spain. And then when I got back, I started learning Spanish like immediately because I was just, uh, I love the country, I love the language. And it was amazing. And I feel like through language learning, you're, you're, not able, you're not only able to learn about the language, but also about the culture as well. And then for the past um, probably a year and a half or so, I've also been learning Mandarin. And I, I, I guess it's also been something that throughout my whole entire life, uh, Mandarin and uh, in Asia in general has been very interesting to me. And I thought Mandarin would just be a, a fantastic language. And I, I've been able to meet a lot of wonderful friends, wonderful people, uh, amazing food, and just great experiences. And I... I don't think these would have happened if I wasn't uh, interested in different cultures and interested in uh, learning languages. So I would say overall, uh, as like a kind of a takeaway from this is that if you have an interest or a hobby, uh, definitely pursue it um, because it, it has the ability to open so many doors and you'll, it, it's just really fun being able to do those things that you love. Awesome. Have you ever been to China? So I haven't been to China uh, or Taiwan just yet, but I did travel to Korea this past summer. And um, at the, before I went, I didn't speak any Korean, but I was able to learn and read, sorry, read and write Hangul, which is the Korean alphabet system. And then while I was there, I was able to uh, just learn the basics, like 30 to 50 words. Uh, but through that time, I was able to meet a lot of, a lot of new friends, uh, new Korean friends along the way. So um, I think another aspect of travel and language learning is just being able to go outside of your comfort zone and experience new cultures and new people. Awesome. So since you have your own YouTube channel and also your own business, what are some advices you would give to entrepreneurs or those who are interested in getting into entrepreneurship, but are kind of hesitant of like where to start and uh, whether they need someone to work with or should they be independent? Yeah. Yeah. Entrepreneurship for sure. So I would say it was, it, it probably took us four, four months to go from an idea to officially launching the business. And I would say per perfection is the, I forget the quote now, but I feel like if you want to, if you want to perfect an idea, it may just take so much time until you actually officially launch the business or the idea. So I would say, don't wait until an idea or a concept is perfect to launch something. I think if you have a good idea, uh, try to get it to a minimal, a minimal viable product, and then launch that either, either pilot that or uh, speak to somebody in the industry who may be interested in some, in that idea or that concept or that project, and then try to get that off the ground. Um, so I would say if you just because 
you can only move so far, I guess, with perfecting an idea. And for example, for us, it took us quite a long time to think of our company name. Like we went through hundreds of different iterations and ultimately we, we landed on a, a name that we're, we're quite very happy with, but there are, you know, limitations still in that. And if we just continued and continued, we may have not got off the ground as, as fast as we uh, would have wanted. And in addition to the question about do you need a partner or not? I think it depends on the type of project or the type of company that you're interested in launching. So for example, if you're somebody from a science background, but you want to you wanna launch um, more of a technical kind of company with a lot of front end and back end required software development, then in that case, you would need to probably either partner with or collaborate with engineers and computer scientists. But I think if you have the skill set to at least initially launch something, I believe if you have the time and the commitment to do so, I think you can totally do it. So ultimately, you know, whatever you, you can, you can do whatever you set your mind to um, ultimately, I would say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a very relevant advice. Actually, I can relate to that advice, like your advice about um, your YouTube channel and your business, because when I wanted to start my own YouTube channel, I was wondering what, like, what quality do I want to present? What content uh, and whether I will be adding new stuff to the YouTube community. And uh, like I have been watching several uh, YouTube videos and even listening to several, um, I would say YouTube uh, successful entrep entrepreneurs. And like, there's one thing that the majority were uh, like repeating uh, or like the majority, I would say agreed on, which is, mm consistency and quantity matters yeah. more than quant than quality at the at the beginning quality comes eventually like you don't have to worry about quality is something that comes eventually yeah no totally i think you're completely right um and that's uh that's something i'm trying to also kind of get in the works is getting a consistent schedule for posting YouTube videos. And then I think any type of content, and that also goes for like work, studying or working on anything. I think being, being consistent in different habits, it can really exponentially uh, increase your growth. Cause even if you improve 1% every day, that's exponential growth. And if you're putting out one YouTube video per week, once again, I think you can, that's has the ability to really grow uh, grow your channel and grow your personal brand. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with that. I think quantity is important, but uh, quality will come, I would say over time. So if you wait, for example, if you wait for your YouTube channel, your lighting, your camera, your editing to be absolutely perfect, you're probably not going to be very successful. And I think it's an iterative learning process. You release a few videos or you you study a concept in a certain way. And then over time, you learn to make it better. You improve on your weaknesses and then you just continue to uh, to get better in that regard. Yeah. And like even especially with YouTube, I feel that most of us struggle with um, the, the, the thing about brainstorming new ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, we are kind of worried whether we are repeating other people's ideas. And like personally, I what I found helpful is watching other YouTubers, what they're doing mm -hmm. uh, and kind of coming with my own idea or even replicating the same idea, but in my own style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think this interview series is fantastic. And of course in the world, other interview series is, exist, but it's, you're taking a very unique approach approach um, by applying this with a, healthcare lens, entrepreneurial lens, just interviewing different people with different interests. And these are, you're talking to people that these type of individuals may, they may not have been spoken to before. So I think you're taking a fantastic approach. And then for myself, uh, for example, like my desk setup video, I did take a lot of inspiration from a lot of different YouTubers, but then I was really able to make it my own. And then film that and create that in the way that I wanted to and showcase that in the way that that I wanted to. And I think a lot of my 
uh, my peers, my friends, my colleagues, and then of course, all of the different individuals on YouTube that have watched my video have been able to take a lot of different learnings that they maybe they haven't from from other channels. So I, I yeah, I think I think that's a fantastic point. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for those valuable tips, and thank you for being a guest speaker on my channel. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me, and I'm wishing you all the best in uh, future interviews. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.